Well, hey everybody, it's Sandy and welcome back to my channel. Today I wanna to talk about the most common question I get asked on this channel and it's not gonna be any surprise to anybody who's been watching me. I, I made a joke a while back that I should temporarily rename my channel The Mask Maven. The question is what's the best mask? So which mask should I buy? And it's so difficult to answer so I thought I would do a video that just discusses my thought process when I try to go through this question with somebody to arrive at a good answer. So first, I just want to give a quick plug to the Sandy's DIY Health Advocacy Facebook page. So you can like and follow that on Facebook. And I've also more recently started a Facebook group associated with that page that you can ask to join. I thought that would be a nice way for people who tune into this channel to start conversations of their own. And so far, I see several people have engaged in it. So I'm really happy to see that. So thank you and welcome. Yeah, so what's the one perfect mask? I wish there was one answer. Um, if there were one answer for this, by the way, guys, I wouldn't be going on to review any other masks. For those of you who don't know my work, I started this channel largely as a public service. So most masks that I have reviewed on this channel, actually all with very few exceptions, uh, I have bought out of pocket so that I can review for you and explain the pros and cons and help you make a good decision. Um, I didn't want the room for bias that commissions might cause. Uh, I don't want to make any money in preying on people's fears. So if I had found already the perfect mask, I would have stopped. Um, that said, I did start thinking about why is there no one answer? Why isn't one mask going to work for everybody if we can find just one good one. There's a few different answers for that. One is that the knowledge keeps changing. So does anybody remember? It's like just a few months ago when we were told that no one needs to wear a mask and this is just all about washing your hands, right? Like the people in Italy hadn't been washing their hands up till now. And then we were told, well, probably a mask is a good idea because large respiratory droplets are certainly a mode of transmission for this virus. So we all wanna keep our large respiratory droplets to ourselves. Let's all cover our faces. And then came the discussion about, well, perhaps the role of aerosols is not as insignificant as we thought. There's probably some transmission of COVID-19 through aerosolized particles. I'm gonna talk more about aerosols later in this discussion, but that's one of the reasons that I can't come up with the perfect mask. Secondly, the market keeps changing. This is a good thing. So there, every time you turn around, there's more masks out on the market. And by the way, guys, I'm always looking for more to review. I recently did a video discussing the masks I chose not to review, but I'm still looking for more. And here's a spoiler alert. I think I found a couple that are worthy of reviews coming up soon and in the fabric category. So uh, that's a category where I've been sorely lacking. And then finally, everybody has a different set of circumstances. And this was the point that I found to be the most significant when I'm trying to walk through this decision with somebody and help them arrive at what might be the best option for them. So what developed in my head is something I call the mass continuum. On the mass continuum, I have two extreme ends. Now on one end is purely fabric masks like the Starks mask that I've recommended. And those masks are just aimed at blockage and filtration. Those masks work best uh, when everybody is wearing a mask. On the other extreme end of the continuum, I have the high-tech textile masks. So masks that are made out of fabrics that are designed to eliminate microbial load. Um, on the extreme end of that continuum would be like the Cupron mask, which has really no focus on filtration. Um, the Synovia is pretty close. It filters at five micron particle size, which will be effective uh, against large respiratory droplets, but I still push it pretty far off onto that end of the continuum. And then you have some in between that I call the hybrids. There is the Living Guard mask, the Aeropec mask, and a while back I reviewed the BioBlock mask by Argamon Technologies. Uh, that mask I didn't recommend at the time because I'm concerned about the overly ambitious filter, but I'm told that they are redesigning that mask, so I'm looking forward to seeing what they come up with. We might have that in the running. Most people who are asking me for this help are people who are in more risky circumstances. So when I say it really has to do with your circumstances, look, if you are in safe circumstances where you can socially distance, and even if you can't, everybody around you is wearing a mask, a lot of the other concerns come off the table. And I would say you can really look more for your preferences. Uh, what feels comfortable, what's washable by machine, you know, whatever are your personal preferences, you can weight more heavily in that decision because you're in a safer place. But those those weren't the people who I found uh, asking me this question. One of the things that I noticed that when I look back at the conversations I had with people is that the first thing I had to talk about wasn't about the mask. The first thing I would sit down and think about is what can I do about mitigating other issues, okay? Not the mask. So for example, um, 
can I make sure windows are open and fans are running? I've had some teachers contact me and say, I've got to go back to teaching in the classroom. Uh, so yeah, can you keep your windows open? Um, requiring other people to wear masks. Are you in a position to make other people wear masks? Or so maybe you're a teacher and it's your classroom and you can require masks. Maybe you can't, but I'm just thinking out loud here about other mitigation factors. So other people wearing it, windows open, fans running, uh, a little bit warmer, a little more humid. That's the concept behind windows open and not just being in a cool, dry, air-conditioned room. Um, less contact, more distance. Shared materials, you can think about that. So if, maybe if you're a teacher, you want to cut down on how much sharing of materials is going on because that creates more contact. What I realized about this is all these mitigation strategies have to do with aerosols. And really the, the $64,000 question boils down to how much likelihood is there that you're going to be coming into contact with aerosols or the environment you're in is generating aerosols. So let me just talk about the everybody wearing masks because if you have anything to say about whether the people around you have to wear masks, that is going to be the best way to reduce uh, the production of aerosols. And why is that? How aerosols are formed uh, when some of these wet respiratory droplets, the smaller ones, are emitted from the nose or mouth and suspended in the air momentarily. And when they come out, if they contact cool, dry air, that is an environment that is conducive to that outer wet layer evaporating. And that's what leaves that tiny little aerosolized particle dancing around in the air. And then it can stay there for like three hours. So one of the things a lot of people complain about with wearing masks is that it feels kind of warm and humid against your face because when you exhale, the exhaled air has to sort of stay there next to you for that extra second or so. That's an environment that's warm and moist, so it doesn't allow those droplets to shed the outer wet layer. They can't evaporate in that condition. They fall into that mask. Everybody wearing masks already cuts down substantially on the potential for aerosol generation. And then the same thing with open windows, like I just said, that's going to reduce the cool, dry air. More ventilation fans going will keep air moving from the inside, outside, and circulating around. The more you can control about these other mitigation factors, the less you're going to have to expect out of just one mask. Now, the other thing I will say is eye protection cannot be overstated. I think eye protection is a good thing to consider anyway, and I think it's under considered in this pandemic, but I would absolutely um, recommend that you use eye protection either in the form of goggles or a shield, um, particularly if you are in a risky setting. What if you just can't? What if there's just no way for you to mitigate any of these other circumstances? So I've heard from some people who like live in countries where wearing masks is shunned, nobody's doing it, these same people have to be on public transportation, probably windows are closed and air conditioning is on. Just the worst of the worst circumstances, the most dangerous, and nothing that you have the control to change. There's a branch in a decision tree that I have to talk about. Now, one way to go is the N95. I am not going to really recommend that on this channel. Uh, first of all, an N95 is hard to find these days. If you look on Amazon, they're reserved for healthcare workers on the front lines, as they should be, and it becomes very expensive. They really are for one-time use. Yes, you can reuse them a couple of times, but not that many. I can see all kinds of problems with the general public wearing N95s. It's a very different experience to have a mask completely sealed on the face, and by the way, the way it works is very much dependent on its seal, and there will just be a lot more having to adjust the mask and put your hands near your face and whatnot. So I just don't see that as a viable alternative, but I will say that if that's the way you're going, I can't say I argue with you. I'm not going to quarrel. And by the way, none of the other things I just mentioned uh, even discussed that there are counterfeit masks on the market right now. And some people think the KN95 is a good alternative, um, which I would disagree with. I did a video on that not too long ago, and I'm going to link that, the N95 versus the KN95. Let's stay away from those for the purpose of this discussion. So at that point, I would start looking at layering techniques or multiple kinds of protective gear. That could mean a few different things. It might mean that you're going to layer multiple masks. Let's say you already have a Synovia. Again, I've said I think is pretty far off to the end of the continuum that's purely high tech. 
and you want to get a little more of something on the filtration end, you can add uh, a plain old disposable surgical mask. You can add a fabric mask. Now, in that case, I would probably put the Synovia on top because it would cut down on the biohazard of the other mask. Um, if you're going to go with a disposable surgical mask to layer, um, you could really do it either way because on the one hand, yes, it would cut down on the biohazard. On the other hand, the surgical mask is disposable, so you'd be just taking it off and throwing it away. It is a little bit water resistant, so you'd be cutting down on what actually has to encounter your Synovia mask. Um, that's just one example. But you might layer a face shield over one of these other masks. Now, I do understand that aerosols aren't going to be completely blocked by a face shield, but I believe just because of the way aerosolized particles behave that a face shield will go a long way. Um, I don't think there's any science on this, so I can't say it with conviction, but I personally have done this. Um, as long as you have a face shield that's going down past the mask, so preferably past the chin. Um, now, why do I say this? Because of the way I aerosol particles behave, they tend to fly in all different zigzag patterns and bounce around. And I sort of liken it to either uh, specks of dust that you see like in a beam of light if you look up toward the ceiling, or if you've ever had like, let's say a tiny down feather get away from you when you're changing a pillowcase and you try to grab it and you know your hand is in the right place and you like, you know you're there and you know you're closing in around it, but it still flies away and you just can't catch it. Aerosolized particles behave kind of like that from what I understand. So they tend to bounce around, they get near something, they ricochet off. So they don't really tend to try to find their way to you. Um, but that said, the whole purpose of this discussion is what you would do if you need to avoid them. So um, I do feel that a face shield, as long as it covers the mask, is probably some good protection. Another thing you can look at is at what I call the hybrid masks in the middle of the mask continuum. The hybrid masks do encompass both uh, filtration and high-tech textiles. So that would be like the ones I have reviewed more recently would be the Living Guard and the Aeropack. I will link those reviews down below so you can uh, decide for yourself based on pros and cons which one might be best for you if you want to go that route. I would say that you still need to be committed to having eye protection if you use the hybrid masks. Um, so still either a face shield or safety goggles. The only other thing I want to mention, it's been a distant drumbeat coming and now I've read about it just recently so I haven't mentioned it before, but you might want to think about the issue of head straps versus ear loops. Now this has been a discussion just for the purpose of comfort and how something feels and how it stays up and how well you can tighten it. But there was a study that was done recently and it found that the head straps really do offer better protection and filter better. Uh, the study was done comparing plain old surgical masks, the kind that tie versus the plain old surgical masks that have ear loops. So that way the only variable was the way it fastened. They were comparing the same masks and the masks with the ear loops did not do as well. Now, in now, just to be fair, surgical masks that have ear loops do not have adjusters. So many of the masks that we've talked about on this channel um, out on the market that have ear loops do have adjusters, so you can definitely get a more custom fit than you can with a surgical mask, but it's still not going to be as good as a head strap. Now, the problem is most of these masks have ear loops only. So if that's the case, you can make it fit more like a mask with head straps by connecting the two ear loops behind your head. So you just get a piece of elastic or something that you're going to tie um, to the right fit. I think elastic would be the best. And and then you connect the two ear loops together and then you have a fit that you get a little more leverage and it fits more like a mask with a head strap. So that's something to think about and I guess I'm going to keep talking about that on this channel now that that's come up and I also think it's something to think about with any mask even if you're not in this situation where you're trying to find the best mask for you given some very dangerous circumstances. I think we all still want our masks to fit, right? So let me know if this was helpful. So like I said, I'm going to be talking soon, I hope, about a couple more fabric masks because I've been really sorely lacking for more fabric masks to review. And I think those are just, given that they're more affordable for most people, and a lot of people live in places where everybody's wearing masks, so it's perfectly acceptable um, to go with that option. I'd really like to review some more. So yeah. And for those of you who haven't subscribed, I hope you'll consider subscribing. And for those of you who are new, welcome and thank you. And until next time, be well. Bye-bye.